JD at Georgetown University Law Center. A US immigration and consular law attorney with almost 20 years of experience, his firm's motto is building the bridge to your American dream because his mission is to help foreign nationals achieve their unique version of the American dream. He launched SMA in 2004, and he's considered an industry expert, having been interviewed by ABC News, CNN, NBC, Bloomberg, NY1, Telemundo, and NY1 Noticias. And I hope I spelled that, pronounced that correctly. Uh, under his supervision, SMA provides comprehensive immigration and consular law services, including assisting US businesses and their sponsorship of foreign nationals through employment and training visas and green cards, investor visas for new startups and green cards based on investments, which was my EB5, uh, as well as family-based petitions and humanitarian cases. With respect to SMA's consular practice, Steve has represented clients at over 50 US embassies and consulates around the world in their visa and waiver application process. Outside of law, Steve has three passions, basketball, singing, and charity work. While living in Argentina, Mr. Maggi played four years of semi-professional basketball while simultaneously managing SMA. Excuse me. He has also been singing since he was had the honour of performing in both Carnegie Hall and the Lincoln Centre. The Steve's right, as many of you will know, is Renea Glendenning. Renea joined Kirkering Barbario and Company in 1987 and was admitted as a shareholder in 1997. She graduated from the University of South Florida with a BA in Business Administration and Master of Accountancy. She's a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants International Tax Committee. She is a Florida Certified Public Accountant, as you may imagine, and she's a, a shareholder in the International Confirmed Consulting and Tax Planning segment for her firm. Her primary practice areas include individual and business tax consulting. She's authored articles regarding various international tax issues and frequently gives presentations on US income and estate taxation of foreign nationals doing business in the US. Making much of the word FERTA, for now, and that's double. Polywalls, but there we go. And finally, on the end, last but not least, is Carla Raymond Kidd. I won't read her spaghetti of, of initials after a name, but it's a whole spaghetti set. She's been a licensed agent since 1997 and achieved her broker's license in 2002. She is a CIPS, RSPS, ABR, SRES, and AHWD instructor and has presented at seminars and associations all over the world. In, a, in addition to teaching classes, she's developed courses geared to students who work with foreign buyers and sellers. Along with being a Florida realtor, Carla is also director of development and strategic engagement for Coral Banker Island Affiliates. She oversees 30 islands from Bermuda to Trinidad and Tobago. Carla has presented at the National Association of Realtors, Prudential and Coral Banker National and International Conventions, as well as conferences across the USA, as well as the Bahamas, Belize, Bermuda, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, France, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Panama, Spain, Thailand, and Venezuela, and clearly has a very fat extent around. <laughs> Carla has served as the past National Association of Realtors Global Coordinator for North America, Central America, and the Caribbean, as well as the former President of the Agents of Panama. She is currently presently elect for FIABCI USA and will be installed as President on May the 6th. I know we will not be there because I'll be on a cruise. But there we go. So there we are. We have a very experienced panel here today. Uh, has anybody in the audience got a question? Who would like to start? Luckily, I had some we prepared earlier, of course. But so let's go to Kimberley first of all. Then, so what's the process for closing when the clients are international or unable to close in a local title office? Um, well, actually, everything um, opened up in during the pandemic. So once the pandemic came around, it kind of really opened up the um, brand closing, uh, the remote online organization. So we're able to connect into all those different companies with uh, US notaries. So um, we have um, 
notaries that work in each different state. So we are able to seek some of the closing processes overseas. Um, for the US, um, you're required to have a passport. Um, so we are able to um, move the round notation to a different state and be able to get over into those areas and be able to use regular IP. So um, we're able to do that via um, remote online and it goes right to um, the internet and we're able to upload those packages and everything kind of electronically. Has anybody got a question for Kim? So if you get somebody in the UK who not here physically for closing, how does that work? Um, they're vetted, so um, it depends, again, with the ID. Um, I'm going to speak for Florida, because for Florida, we need to we require a passport for any out-of-state um, customer. If they're in the United States when they're signing, um, we can use uh, their uh, credit history along with their ID, but they do require for Florida a passport, so it has to be a passport. So. In the event that there's no cash flow, we can move it to a different location out of Florida to be able to get those done. Um, the system actually takes those IDs and we do a KBA, which is an analysis of your um, credit history. So they need to have three to five years of the credit history to be able to proceed with the closing. Um, also, there's a credentialing process there that actually checks the ID. So technically, it's almost more secure then how we do it now with physical um, notarizations. Um, show you this like here. Um, notaries are trained to be able to look through and match up the credentials that are on each one. Um, it gets spacing and um, all the information on the next step to make sure the ID is accurate. Again, we're doing that physically through um, looking at the documents. So um, what the uh, credentialing system Ruban does is it actually matches up that ID and makes sure it's official. So you can have a more accurate um, identification of that group. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Frank, Frank Chaviano with Cal Williams. Uh, so you mentioned credit history. So if somebody's international, they don't have credit history. How does that work as far as the buyer? Yeah. So, so sorry, I need to just repeat the question. It's got people online and, and we're not mic'd up so they can't hear it. So the, okay. so the question was um, if somebody's overseas and they haven't got, I'm seeing you talking about a US credit history. Right? Yeah. So they're overseas, they have no US credit history. How does the process work? They're using their passport um, or we can move it to a different state where they can use the ID. So they don't have that credit history, but they're matching up that passport ID. Um, or credible witnesses. We can also use credible witnesses, say Virginia. Um, they're able to use incredible witnesses to validate that person. So those are a benefit for even local if you have somebody that um, they didn't have to move at the facility and they didn't renew their IDs. It happens a lot. People are in, they don't have access to, to go do that. Um, we can get around to have two credible witnesses sign that they're they're who they say they are and proceed with the So it's really all about knowledge and knowing the different areas and what the requirements are to be able to, and also be honest, what states not in use because there are some not the state in use. Patricia? Um, does the foreign buyer or seller need an IT in order to close remotely? Um, so, so the question was does the foreign buyer or seller need an IT in order to get it closed? Or what? An IT, you know, exactly the same. Yeah, no. You know, it's just a password. So you don't go to sunbiz.com. Okay. Okay. Uh, for no, I, I personally don't. But the credentialing that system would match up anything, but not international. Okay. So moving on in Steve, let's let's hit you with a question. So let's go to my one of my pet subjects, the EB5. What's happening with the EB5 program? And how can your clients use it? Well, when we see with the EB-5 program, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's a program that started more than 20 years ago that was designed to bring in foreign investment to create or stimulate U.S. jobs. And the stipulation was that you would invest half a million dollars into a project, 
would get a conditional green card for you, your spouse, and your children under 21. And then when you move to the US, you would show that at least 10 full time jobs were created through your direct investment to get a permanent green card. When the program started, there were only 10,000 visas per year. And the problem, as Ivan knows, he didn't have to go through because he's not a Chinese national or an Indian national. But what happened was China exploded, the GDP exploded, the property values went up tenfold in a very short amount of time. And that cap is not per investor, but it's actually per year for all the family members. We had a case for an Indian national who had 11 children and a spouse. And they used 13 of those 10,000 visas for that particular year, just to give you an example. So it wasn't contemplated correctly. And as a lot of you know, the immigration law has not changed since 1986. So it's not adapted or flexible. And so there's a 7% cap for that program per country. And it was never applied until all of a sudden there were too many applications or too many visas. And then they retroactively applied it. And that meant for countries like China and then later on in India, um, there was a huge backlog. On top of that, when they started the program, there were, I think, 500 applications filed in the first year. When I did my first one, I think there were 3,000 that year. Um, then all of a sudden it reached that cap. And so now there are there wasn't enough staffing either. And USCIS, the immigration services here, is self-funded through filing fees. So they didn't get any money from the government. No more personnel was added. Now we have a three-year waiting time just to get the first petition approved. And then you have, if you're Chinese or Indian, then you have another two and a half year wait on top of that. And as Ivan knows, your, your capital can be locked up for a, a specific amount of time. That's extended. And then that two-year period, you have to show the jobs were created. Maybe that project is already over now. So it's become almost impractical. And on top of that, the minimum threshold for investment went from 500000 to 800000 And for a lot of people who literally were selling their properties or, or getting rid of everything they could to get to that amount, when you add an extra three hundred thousand dollars plus all the administrative fees and legal fees, it's out. It's really something that's out of reach for a lot of people. And so there's very few advantages now to actually using the program. And what we do in a lot of cases is find alternative visas, like setting up your own company overseas, then setting up their U.S. subsidiary, running your own company, making money on it immediately, and creating the jobs, and then. You know, or you, there are other green cards that are available for people if you have economic means, but you can't. Otherwise, you're looking at people that are okay with just forgetting about eight hundred thousand dollars and all the other fees for periods of maybe seven or eight years. And most people are not okay with that now. Because I'm sure when I did it, I think the processing time was maybe four months for those I five twenty six fees. From my personal experience, it took me four and a half years. To research and get through the regional center to get my initial green card four and a half years and my money was tied up from 2011 to 2021 so 10 years right so i would say you might double that now right. but especially if you're one of those people that u.s subsidiary they do set it up does that still have to be providing 10 jobs no. so, so sorry i just need to repeat the question online can't help so the question was if the, a u.s subsidiary is set up is the 10 job requirement still there so the answer is no actually what we do is we do this for a lot for our chinese and Indian clients if you have an existing foreign company you set up a subsidiary and then within one year you can be transferred it's called an intra-company transfer visa l1 and that's the bridge to another kind of EB1, which is called EB1C, which is for multinational managers or executives. So all you have to do with the green card is to show that you've created a hierarchy and that you're what's called removed from day-to-day -day conditions. So if you're an executive, all that means is you need to have a general manager in place and some support and employees and be generating enough revenue to pay those salaries. And then you show that your plans are to, to grow the business. So it usually takes us about three years once it, you're on the L1 to get them with your card. And they're managing their own money, if not in somebody else's hands for 10 years. A lot of these investments, the money doesn't last. They don't get their return. Maybe they don't create the 10 jobs. So you eliminate that requirement of having your money in somebody else's control. You're in control of your own destiny. You can generate revenue right away. 
This is obviously for people who are for no good reasons, people not who want to passively invest, and that's why EB5 is so popular because clients just move to one beach or something, and they're just hanging out, and somebody else does it for them. The problem is most people can't wait that long, and they don't have that much disposable income. Hopefully, your clients do, but most you know, it's kind of being worked. <laughs> like in the back. Um, I'm Leanne, but, um, uh, I'm actually from Colombia originally. Um, so a lot of people are trying to, you know, because now there's a new president, so it's a lot of people are trying to get out. So this is very important for me. Um, so you're saying it's better, like, if somebody has, like, already a business established, let's say Colombia as an example, it's better to do a subsidiary in the States so they can move faster rather than maybe selling a part of their assets down there and maybe coming in here and investing in a franchise, let's say McDonald's or something like that, yeah. that produces that kind of money. So if I'm just trying to capture the question, um, from Colombia, is it better to uh, a subsidiary company and do it that way, or is it quicker to sell your assets and invest directly? I'm sorry, before you continue, Zoom is having a hard time hearing you guys. If you could you hold the speaker up to your mouth and see if that makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you. So Colombia has a treaty, a bilateral treaty with the US called the E2 Treaty Investment Treaty. And that, that enables any Colombian citizen that sets up any US entity to self-sponsor and get a five-year visa with unlimited renewals. So that's the franchise route. We worked with a lot of Colombians doing the franchise. And we were, I was part of that trade mission that we took down to um, Barranquilla last year. And it was a week before the election. So we know this is something that's really capital flood and all that. Is, but the good news is that they have that possibility. So you don't have to have an existing business. If you do have an existing business, the advantage is you can set up a subsidiary and then qualify for a green card through your business. That's the difference between the E2 and the LE. Your, your option is open to the company. Hey, um, IMG Academy was just bought by Swedish uh, Equity. Can you buy your employees? So the question, sorry, the question was um, IMG Academy, that clean rates has just been bought for 1.25 billion, I think it was, yeah. and by a Swedish buyer. And so the question is, can the Swedish investor buy their employees and get a drink out? We're talking to you five again. I don't know. What are we well, yes. Okay. So technically, you, you have to show new job creation where we meet and solve it and full time jobs. Well, how about 6,000? <laughs> well, then you can probably create a sub business and, and bring in other EB5 investors and a lot those 10 out of the 6,000 and divide them by 16 months to 600 investors and get you know, $48 million in investment. If you, you want to show that that was direct job creation. Should the Swedish equity partner secure the green card? Uh, I mean, I'm sure if they can buy IMG, I can get them a green card. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's move on down the panel then. So, Renea, let's, uh, we'll park first for the moment because we do lots of other things on first, right? Um, so, how does a seller obtain a US certification? Okay, that, that's a very interesting question. The IRS, an I, we call it an I 10. I'll try and move over here. It's an individual taxpayer identification number. And the IRS issues these numbers. However, they're very particular as to who they issue the numbers to and when they issue them. So from an IRS perspective, you uh, somebody only needs a tax ID number if they have something to report to the Internal Revenue Service. So I get phone calls saying, I'm going to be listing my property and I was told I need to get my tax ID number before I close. You can't, okay? If you're only listing property, you don't have a requirement to report, file a tax return with the IRS. So they will not give you that number. So we have to wait 
until after the closing. We send all the documentation on the closing, the contract, the closing statement, possibly the withholding forms, and show the IRS that this person has a requirement to file a tax return. And going back to Kimberly, um, the IRS requires a copy of their passport, but they specifically do not accept a notarized copy of a passport. They did up until 2012, and then they changed the rules. They require a certified copy of a passport or another particular type of document, but the passport is the most common document. And their definition of a certified document is it is certified as being true by the agency that issued the document. So to get a certified copy of a passport, you have to go to your passport agency. Okay. Now, that's not always possible. And if they are physically in Florida at the time, what we do is if somebody's listing property and they're here, we meet with them. We have been authorized by the IRS. We have a contract with them to certify passports. So we're what we call certified acceptance agents. So we meet with them, we do the face-to-face -face interview because we have to see them and we have to see the original document. So we will certify the, the passport, we'll have them sign a form, the W-7, that's the application for the tax ID number, and then we wait until after they have closed then to submit the application for the I-10. Questions for Renee? Can I ask about Trump here? Yeah, Trump here. Trump here. Trump here. Uh, I think we all hear. Yeah. If one of the sellers is a US citizen and the other, I mean, the is a foreign national. Thanks, I'm just going to repeat the question for those online. The question was um, if you've got two sellers, husband and wife, or whatever it might be, one's a US citizen, the other one is a foreign national, what happens with the Okay. Assuming that they, jointly own title to the property. Uh, the the uh, FERPTA is, FERPTA withholding is not required of US citizens, okay? But it is a foreign sellers. So 50% of the gross sales price would be subject to the withholding. Any other questions? Lady the back. So, I mean, it's not an issue to buy for a foreign person taking part of the passport. But it's a problem a race when he's when he's term when he's time to sell, right? That's when they need the IR the the IT. the IT number to um for whatever the procedure of making the money. And then my question is, um, can they do an exchange in order? Yeah, an exchange in order to avoid do, do you having mean, to pay the tax. A 1031 exchange, is that what you're asking? Or any sort of exchange? An exchange on a, let's say, another buy another power. Okay. So just, again, just for those people online, then the question is, uh, a foreign buyer can buy a piece of property without any problem. When it comes time to sell, can they transfer that gain to a new purchase? Oh. Can they? Generally, um, now it has to qualify under code section 1031. So it's not just I'm selling a property and I buy another one. They have to go through a very specific procedure for 1031 purposes. Okay. But my question is just because they can, should they? And generally speaking, no. I mean, there are some circumstances and here's why. From a U.S. standpoint, they can defer paying the gain, the tax on the gain on what we call the relinquished property and roll it into the replacement property. That gain does not go away. It just gets taxed at a later point in time. Okay, so when the replacement property is sold and they don't do another exchange, that's when you're paying the tax in the US. So your gain on the sale of that second property is probably going to be greater because you're combining the gain of both properties, okay? Now, if I'll just give this as an example, 
if you're from the UK or um, Canada, okay, they also have worldwide reporting for tax purposes. So they have to report the sale of that US property in their home country. They don't care that you did a 1031 exchange in the US. So you're gonna pay tax currently on that profit in your home country. If you pay no tax in the US because you deferred paying that tax, you lose out on getting a tax credit in your home country. So ultimately it could cost you a lot more in tax by doing that exchange. So you have to look at both countries to really make the decision. And is that just the UK and Canada, just those two countries, or were you just using that as an example? So the question was, does that lack of tax deferment relate just to the cap to Canada and the UK, or is it in general? I don't know, because I don't know the tax laws of every country, but I, I know those two in particular, and Germany too. Most of them have worldwide reporting now. So let's move on to Carla. Uh, I'll ask Carla, what are the biggest mistakes agents make when working with international clients? Mm -hmm. Uh, one is they they try to move things too quickly. I would say that you need to slow down the pace because whenever you're working with an international buyer or seller, it's all about building that relationship first to develop trust between the, the two parties. Um, secondly, I would say not taking the time to understand the culture. You may speak the language and that's great, but if you don't understand the culture, uh, that first faux call you make may just sever the relationship in, in general. Um, not learning how real estate is done in their country would probably be the, the third thing I would mention because you have to understand how they tick. So if they're coming here at real estate, I mean, I would mention in the UK, you know, they bounce from real estate uh, property shop, they call them the one to the next uh, real estate firm in order to see different listings. So when they come here, it's very common that they're going to go from one store to, you know, one real estate firm to the other because they think they have to see you to see that particular listing. So if you know how real estate is done in that particular country, it's going to help you get inside the mind of the buyer or seller to really understand how, uh, what you need to explain and how it's different here. And then I would say, you know, learning a little bit how they negotiate in their home country, because that's going to be really, <laughs> really, it's not like, it may be really key in you winning that deal. If you understand their psyche and know, okay, traditionally in this country, you know, they're going to negotiate in this particular manner. Um, they may, you know, always tend to negotiate on the way to the end, or they may come from a country where this is it. I'm done, I walk away no matter what, right? And you have to understand that that sort of thing. And then uh, lastly, I would say not talking about FERPTA whenever you're going on that listing appointment. Uh, that's extremely important. There are cases where in Florida in particular, an agent was sued because he did not disclose FERPTA and uh, ended up having to, to pay a fine for that. So don't be afraid to talk about it. It's no one likes to talk about paying money, right? It's a withholding, it's not a tax. So, but people think, oh, well, if I tell the seller, you know, that there's going to be this chunk of money from their proceeds held, you know, I'm, let's just deal with that at the closing. Let the closing agent tell them that. That's not a good idea. So definitely be upfront about that. So another key difference from the UK is in the UK, a tenant pays the property taxes. Whereas in the US, it is the owner that pays the property taxes. And that can make quite a significant difference to your yield in that investment property. So investors have always got their eyes on the numbers. And if they're coming from the UK, they're not expecting typically to pay the property taxes, which is a big number. Yeah, could be a big number. Anyway, any questions for Carl? <laughs> Go on, Christine. I know I promised you I wouldn't ask for it. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, because Mrs. Cash is now turned up, so we can start now. Come on, Paula. Paula's ignoring me as well. Uh, okay, <laughs> how does FERPTA apply to help Sorry, I'm late. foreign corporations get settled in the US? It's back to you. Back to me. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by help them. 
Uh, I've had people who are from another country, they have a business here, it's registered with Sunbiz, they avoid FERC. If it's a U.S. corporation, I think you need to repeat the question. Yeah, sorry, I was just making the the question. So, if somebody bought a property through a U.S. registered business, and they, yeah. are you saying the U.S. registered business is the owner of the property? Exactly. Okay, so that's so presumably, and I'm not trying to answer the question, but presumably the, the business will be liable to any any tax they might be due. But the question was for Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's for to apply. The, the FERPTA withholding, the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act, which has been around since 1980. Somebody told me before, <laughs> oh, was it new? No. Um, it applies to what they define as foreign sellers. Okay? A U.S. corporation, by definition, is not a foreign seller. So it's not subject to the FERPTA withholding. However, it's subject to tax. So it, the, their case, as Carl said, the FERPTA withholding is simply a free payment. Help that. That's correct. A beautiful thing for a company here in Sunbiz. Well, it's well, there are foreign corporations that are registered on Sunbiz, but if they're foreign corporations, they they're subject to FERPTA. They live here and their company is. But they're foreign corporations. No, they're not. No, I'm just saying there are foreign corporations no. registered on Sunbiz. Yeah. So you can't just say because it's on Sunbiz, it's not subject. No, but if it is, okay. so then we're getting into the weeds a bit. But there we go. Right. Sorry, I thought so, okay. so back to Carla. As a lot of the residential realtors here and trying to get some business, what are some of the best ways for agents to build their global real estate business? Okay. I would say definitely, you know, if you're not a member of our global business council, I think that's a great way to get started. Also, Go to the Florida Realtor Conferences, go to their global meetings there twice a year there in Orlando. Uh, definitely the NAR meetings as well. It's a great way to understand what's going on, and not only you know, in the United States, but across the world, because people come from all over. And we talk about a lot of different programs and things that are going on. Uh, once you have a little bit of an understanding of that, I would say get on your GBC committee, your Florida Realtors Global Committee, NAR, apply, because then that takes you to a different level of understanding. Uh, join other organizations, you know, the Canadian Real Estate Association, I would say the Asian Real Estate Association of America, uh, NARIC, which is the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, and FIOPSI, which I mentioned earlier, I mean, U.S. President and next Saturday. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's the oldest real estate federation that started back in Paris uh, back in the 19, late 1940s. So it's all disciplines of real estate, uh, architects, developers. So it's a, a very large and, and different organization. Just so find your niche and what works well for you. But definitely get involved. Um, I would say, you know, educate yourself as much as possible. Read, 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 read everything. I mean, my business partner sitting back here, she knows how many newspapers I subscribe to, and I'm always studying her articles and cutting things out. But that's how you learn what's going on around the world. You know, don't just look at what's on television. I mean, really dig into, you know, if you decide that Sweden's going to be your market, then, you know, start reading the, the news and in English and a Swedish newspaper, understand you know what those ads look like, what calls to action look like, what people want. Uh, you'll you'll understand things much differently from a different perspective, right? So, you... so I think that brings me to another question: Is are you representing an agent focus on Mexico or Colombia or Sweden or you know picking a target market and trying to become the expert in that segment? It, yes, I think whatever's natural for you. Uh, would make a great niche if it's a country that you go to all the time or perhaps you're from that particular culture uh, that it makes sense you cannot be everything to everyone uh, saying you know you're an agent to the world i'm sorry it just can't be because you don't know just like when i said you know i don't know tax in all the countries in the world you can't possibly know the real estate practices all over the world so pick something that you know is going to make sense to you um, but, and but be consistent, I guess that's one of my, my last tips. Um, 
definitely, you know, don't just do something once. You have to be consistent and do things over and over again uh, in order to make things work successfully for you. Ivan, can I make a comment? So, um, the one thing all my clients have in common is that they're all from somewhere else. And so, what I did to build my client base was number one, join foreign chambers of commerce, anything like the Brazil, Florida Business Council, or whatever is local here that you can meet people specifically from certain countries. And I agree with her that it's great to leverage your cultural connections, your languages. That's your strength. People will trust you more and you have something in common with them. But then I, I, I've taken it a step further in the way that I've built my business because most of my clients are outside of the US and I have to I have to reach them somehow. So you take those contacts that you make here and in the different communities, and then you start leveraging that by doing presentations overseas. And I'm not talking about just going to conferences because you go to a conference and there's 500 people that do exactly what you do that are competing with, with everyone else for the same people. What I'm saying is take, take a real risk and set up your own presentations and do a tour. Like next year, I'm going to do five cities in India with the, the person who runs the international part of the Long Island Board of Realtors. I used to be in New York for a long time. And we're going to take his contact and we're going to present in front of all those interested buyers and potential, hopefully, visa applicants. Take a chance, go to them, because when you build a relationship face to face, even though you can build things organically and through websites and even have servers in India or whatever country you choose and set up your websites, they want to see somebody's face. When, when you meet them first, when you get the first point of contact, it's amazing. I did a presentation back in Amsterdam in 2014, and I still have clients coming in through the first one that I got. And that's because I was there face to face with those people. So I think that it's great to join all these organizations and, and even do the trade missions, but pick your countries logistically, you know, logistically and then go and actually meet these people. So staying with you then, Steve. So what are the major pitfalls in immigration planning and why is that those important for real estate brokers as well? Wow, okay. Well, I've done entire three hour presentations about the calls. I, I think that two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Okay. I tell people certain things. Number one, never improvise. You can never over plan and, and you have to have a holistic. I'm talking about people that are outside of the US. So if, if you're if you're talking to potential buyers, and I, I get presentations to real estate groups all the time because I'm teaching them the A to Z, just the basics, because you have to be able to identify what their short and long-term plans are, and then work with other professionals that can help you do a holistic plan because otherwise that client is gonna fall through. And what you really want eventually, if they're not just doing it for the purposes of making money or just to have a get a tear, but they want physical presence here, is to look after their interests long-term and that involves an immigration strategy. So I would say the pitfalls are improvising, and then the other thing is misinformation. I always tell people after my first initial consultation, and sometimes it's painful because I'll have to talk to them many times, but I tell them, don't get your information somewhere else. Like, don't go on the forums for the Greek community in, in Tarpon Springs, you know, that people want to move here because you'll hear all sorts of stories that might necessarily be true. Um, and so go to the source. So make sure that you're well informed, that you have a team that includes very importantly tax specialists and real estate specialists and notaries and everything else and the right lawyers so you have a holistic plan in place when you do that and you're the you're the first point of contact but you have your team that you create for each specific client to meet their needs you're not only taking care of them but you're you're bringing in potentially other clients through them long term can we just check if we've got any questions from the online no questions are yet. Okay, perfect. So let's come back to Kimberly then. So, what are some of the benefits of having the remote online notarization? Well, overall, the process is more secure um, for us, as I mentioned before, that we have to um, scan the identification um, with our eyes and actually um, validating that person. Um, in front of us. When you do a run, um, more so you're going to have somebody, if they're being willing to be videotaped, because um, all those transactions are videotaped through run, 
um, providing that um, extra credentialing for the validation of the IDs um, within the US, having those um, questions that are, you know, with your credit history, you need to answer all those appropriately or you cannot move on. Um, so between those three sets of um, circumstances, plus you have the notary that's there also doing, um, they have to hold up their ID. Um, so they do that face-to-face -face validation also. But you know, with the credentialing that they have for the IDs and then also that um, data set that they're checking to make sure that people know um, that everything matches their history. So, um, and we have the act of the Security Act of 2020 that actually um, makes those notarizations um, recognizable through all the states in the US. Going back to Renee, then here's a very interesting question. How can you determine if the sellers of US real estate are actually foreign or not? You would think that most of the time that it's, it's easy, somebody's a foreign person, and most of the time it is. But there are lots of circumstances where it may be very um, unusual. For instance, uh, there are people who live outside of the US who may be US citizens. And just because they live in Germany or the UK or Canada, if they're a US citizen, by definition under the US tax law, they are never foreign. So they may live in another country, but they're not subject to the FERC debt. You could have somebody who has a green card. This comes up all the time. I'll get closing agent say we've got sellers and this person has a green card and this work to apply just by saying somebody has a green card i can't give you an answer to that generally speaking if an individual has a green card they are tax residents in the u.s that's the purpose of having a green card you're living in the u.s right but there are instances where People have green cards. They could be living outside of the U.S. And there's a provision in the income tax treaty between the country where they're living and the U.S. So there are circumstances where people with green cards can still claim non-resident tax status. If that's the case, then they are foreign for purposes of birth day, even though they have a green card. Um, the other instance where we run into, which can get quite interesting, is um, the seller is a U.S. LLC, a limited liability company. Is withholding required? I say I don't know because it depends. If that um, LLC has what we call a single member, only one owner, and that owner of that company has not made any sort of election from an IRS standpoint, it, it's what we call disregarded for tax purposes. So it's treated as if it doesn't exist, only for tax reporting purposes. If the single member of that LLC is a foreign person or a foreign corporation, then yes, it's subject to the withholding because that's the one that's considered the seller, not the LLC. But if you have a US LLC that has more than one member, it defaults to being taxed as a partnership. So by definition, it's not a foreign seller. So even though all the owners may be foreign, it's not subject to FERC withholding. And you think you're great. However, there's a provision in the law that says it's subject to what they call partnership withholding. So there is a withholding provision, but it's done in the entity, not done at the sale of the real estate. And then you have a U.S. LLC, which could be taxed as a corporation. It could be a single member or a multiple member LLC. And if it is filed form with the IRS that says we wish to be taxed as a corporation, then it's treated as a U.S. corporation and further withholding doesn't apply. So you can see with LLCs, you have to ask a lot of questions before you can get the answer. And as that answer tells you, if you come across any foreign, foreign person, take advice. <laughs> Don't try and do it yourself because that's where it will go probably wrong. So moving on to a different topic, Carla, can I list a property overseas for one of my customers? Yeah. 
Okay, I will say the answer is yes. If you have a visa or a work permit to work in that country. Otherwise, absolutely not. That's what referrals are for. Uh, the other thing is that you are violating your code of ethics, most likely. Talk about uh, standard practice 11.1, where you have to be, be knowledgeable about the type of property that's being valued. You have to have access to all the information and resources necessary to formulate an accurate opinion. You have to know the area. If you're listing a property in Costa Rica, for example, and you've never been there, but your next door neighbor has a property there, you're violating your code of ethics. Same thing, um, your, your brokers should all know that your e &O insurance does not cover you. So if there's a problem with that transaction and it comes back to your broker, your e &O insurance, you're exposed. Your broker's not gonna cover you whatsoever. Yes, Jamie, there's a question. How do you handle Canadian sellers that are only part-time residents for a closing? For example, are, are in Canada when the closing is to take place? Okay. Is that a question for me from a closing aspect or? I think it's a Kimberly question, isn't it? Pardon me? It's a Kimberly question. How do you close? Okay. Well, I suspect. Okay, it would, be, it would be just like anybody else if they were in Ohio or New York. I mean, you have to get all the applicable, you know, all the documents and then everything you need for closing. If they're in Canada, then yes, Kimberly would come into play as would Renee with respect to FERPTA, but everything can be, come, can be done remotely. I mean, Pat and I had a client who couldn't come from the UK during the pandemic. We hired a moving company, we went over, we packed up all their stuff, we did a video for them, we went through every drawer, every cabinet, said, what do you want, what do you don't want? We had the mover come, they packed it up, they never came to the United States. We did everything. Like that. So, yeah, it can be done, it's just called work. Great service, great service. <laughs> That's so true. Love it. So, any other questions in the room? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, my name is Ron, and I'm from Virginia, uh, licensed in Virginia, and I'm CIPS certified in the United States. I worked for the last few years in, in Morocco. It doesn't need a license to work in Morocco. There is no code of ethics yet. Um, there's no structure to stay uh, in Morocco yet. So uh, I was wondering if, like, uh, if I'm listing some, uh, having some listings from Morocco, if I am able to. Uh, so this, to put them in Omar as right Okay, so the, the question is the ladies from you're, you're from Morocco originally. I'm from Morocco. Right? You're not in Virginia originally, I would hazard a go. No. Okay. <laughs> so the ladies from Morocco originally, she's here now licensed in Florida and is asking whether oh, she can Virginia. Virginia, sorry. Right. So but you're licensed in the US. Right. There is no licensing regime in Morocco. No. Can I list property in Morocco and put it on the MLS? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you're listing it in the United States in our MLS, offering compensation. So you're violating your National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. Just because there isn't a code of ethics in another country doesn't mean you're violating licensing law here. So theoretically, you're violating your code of ethics, you're also exposed, like I said, because you're, you know, cover you. Um, if you're a CIPS, you know that's what the referral network is for. So you should be referring it to an agent who lives and works full time in the real estate industry in Morocco. Because you can't show the property. I mean, if you choose to move back to Morocco, I was going to do that. Do you, you, okay, you live in Morocco, so you have the, yes, but so you can do whatever you want. If, you, if you're a Moroccan citizen and you want to sell property while you're there, the problem comes listing it here in the United States. And how your license is affected here in the United States. Tell me, Carla, does any other country in the world have the licensing structure that the United States has? Because there's there's no licensing arrangements in the UK. Canada is probably our our closest. Closest, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, they operate very similar to what we do. Uh, the reason you know I'm so passionate about not listing overseas is one. I mean, you're just. It's just a, a textbook for failure or disaster coming your way. 
Uh, but secondly, our partners overseas who do this full time are really upset with us because, you know, imagine if everybody from Ecuador came here and just started to sell real estate. How would you feel? I mean, the whole business is referral. So, what you know, you know, I would go over to Miami and sell property. I don't know the Miami real estate market. We have agents in Longboat Key who won't go out to Labor Ranch. They don't know it. They don't want to go there. No refer. I think right? they need a passport. And so, I mean, just stick with what you know and do a referral. Getting you do nothing to get that nice little referral check, other than give somebody a name and let the other professional run and do what they do best. So back to Renata, we're surrounded by more mature people, shall we say. What happens when you've got a foreign person who is who's deceased and the, um, whoever it is, the family sold the property? Oh, it's it's much worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be short and sweet. Yeah. Um, Carl and Pat get upset with me when I talk about dead people, but it's it's a huge, huge issue. And so what happens is, um, you know, there is a, an estate tax, a debt tax in the U.S., but for those people who live here, resident in the U.S., our exemption currently this year is just uh, slightly under $13 million, okay? So I'll talk for myself. That's not going to be an issue when I die. However, for non-residents, people who do not live in the U.S., that exemption is sixty thousand. Period. Unless the property is valued at sixty thousand or less at date of death, not what they paid for it, and a, a U.S. estate tax filing is required. Okay, most people have no idea about this. So what happens in the majority of our cases, how we get these referrals is the surviving spouse or got one now, it was a, a, a mother and a son and the mother, they were on title and the mother died. But usually it's a, it's a surviving spouse and it could be who knows how many years later wants to sell the property. Well, there's a deceased person on title. First question is, when did they die? What was the value of the property at date of death? Nine nine thousand nine hundred nine times out of ten thousand, it's more than sixty thousand. Then the next question is, you know, was the state the U.S. estate tax return filed? Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, what? Have no idea. Okay, so here's the problem: it's not necessarily now you have to file the estate tax return if you're from a country with whom the U.S. does not have an estate tax treaty, which they're only 14, so it's not a lot, okay, the next tax that's, due, that's payable after 60000 okay. If you're from a treaty country, there still could be tax due, but the, depending on the provisions of the country, it's likely that there'd be very little or no tax due. The problem being is how that person's selling the property. The title company says, wait a minute, there's a potential for an estate tax liability that could be a claim against this property. So generally what happens is they put an exception on the title policy that doesn't cover anything having to do with the estate tax liability because the IR, they do not have IRS approval that that has been paid and it's been filed. They let the closing go through, they let the title transfer, but I see it multiple, multiple times where the closing company holds 100% of the closing proceeds. The seller gets nothing, okay? And they hold the proceeds until such time as the IRS confirms that that tax liability has been handled. Currently, it's three years. How many years? Three, three years. The IRS is so far behind. I have a hundred returns going back to being filed from 2019 that I'm still waiting for the IRS to approve. To have exceptions. Uh, there's no exception. Except 
uh, exemption. Well, exemption. no, just because just because you uh, put in a return that says zero tax and you give them all the information until they give you a letter that says yes, we agree with you, it's not. It's just in one Okay, you have to get the blessing from the IRS on those. So people get really upset about ERCA, and that's all they talk about. But this estate tax issue is a much, much, much greater issue than for the issue. Okay. And I'll just say in the past two years, we've done about 30 returns a year. Through the first four months of this year, we've already done 30. So it's a huge issue. So just be very careful if you're taking a listing or you know a non resident or somebody on the title side. Because the and the state tax return is actually due nine months after date of death, so most of these returns are years late to being filed. Okay. Um, so just coming back to if you've got a Canadian buyer that's closing in Canada and there's documents going backwards and forwards and you've got group and that notary, what's the typical cost of that process and who pays? Well, it depends. Sorry. It depends um, if it's a purchase or um, a seller's package. We, a lot of them that we do now are the warranty deeds, which we do, you know, with the witnesses, um, we're able to provide them to run. Um, so typically I would say for a purchase, it's around 225. Um, and for a seller's package, it's about 125, 150. And presumably, um, that the client, the, whoever the seller or the buyer is, pays that. Yeah, it also depends on location, um, what kind of um, platform that the notary is using for those rounds. Um, they're all different costs. So, obviously, they have to make um, some money doing those closings. So, it depends location and, again, that platform that they're using. Okay, so, we've just got time for a couple more questions. Uh, Steve? What's the most important way to get your clients to the US and be able to service them? I mean, the obvious answer is to send them to me. You have to you have to be able to ask them some hard questions. And you have to, like I spoke about before, you have to talk about short term and long term. And unfortunately, that, that requires transparency that requires bringing in other experts and, and sometimes the tax thing will counteract the you know the immigration plans or you have to find a middle ground sometimes um, but I think the most important thing is to ask them short term and long term what their goals are some people want to live in the U.S. some people don't some people want green cards some people want you know these E2 visas I have a client that's had it for 20 years they don't want a green card um, tax averse, you know, what are their priorities? You have to get to know them enough to look at for their long-term and their short-term plans. And then you need to, when you're bringing in the immigration part, if they want to live here, you have to build in a plan that takes that into consideration. Their family members, their kids who usually age out for most of these categories at 21, what are their plans for them? Um, and to look out for that, because if you don't, the worst thing that can happen is you, you find them a short-term solution and all of a sudden, like we just saw with the Google and Amazon tech layoffs in Silicon Valley, 10% of those people laid off were foreign nationals who are on the path to a green card or were on temporary work visas, and most of them have to go home. So you want to make sure that you have them in touch with the professional that can come up with alternate strategies or have a plan A. A lot of the visas that we do empower our clients to be self-dependent and not depend on employers or on other people because somebody pulls the rug out from under you and all of a sudden you're out of status and you have to uproot your family and you have to move back to where you're from that's not what you want as a real estate person you want long-term relationships because then they go back to istanbul or cairo or, or you know uh, cape town or wherever they're from and they say this person didn't look out for me they were my point of contact. They didn't give me the right professionals to work with. Now I have no plan. I have to leave. And then your reputation in that community is sour. And that's how we build our relationships internationally is with that first person. And then a lot of it is word of mouth within that community overseas. So it's, it's all about planning and looking out for their short-term and long-term interests, getting to know them and really 
doing a, a deep dive into what they really want and then having a plan for them. So one of the risks that I researched in my four and a half years before I got my EB5 was if the EB5, if the investment fails, you have to have your money at risk. And if that investment fails, not only do you lose your money, but you don't create the jobs and you don't get your green card, you're completely up the creek without a paddle. So there's a famous case of a ski resort in Vermont where it was fraud, Jay Peaks, that, that, that failed and all of the EB5 applicants through that scheme didn't get their green card and lost their money. There was an office building in Seattle um, that um, Reader's Digest were in. They were the main anchor tenant in that office building and Reader's Digest went bust and they stopped paying the rent and the investment failed and they didn't get their thing. Um, and then there was a, an Air Force base, a closed Air Force base out in California um, that the local city were trying to repurpose. And the trouble typically with an Air Force base is there's a single track road in and out. And it's very difficult to get, you know, 14 wheel trucks down these roads. So they basically rose, raised a load of money to expand the road network and to do the infrastructure to get this base repurposed. And the local city defaulted that scheme failed and the investors were left with literally a hole in the ground. Literally. Thank you for scaring me. <laughs> I've never, never recommended to be fine. Oh, we got my new friends. <laughs> what I always, what the, the magic question you want to ask, you want to protect your clients and prospective clients by making sure that their investment is protected. A lot of people do not get their full return, but what, how do you quantify the value of the green card for you and your family? That's what people really want. And that means the jobs have to be created. So the question to be asked is, what percentage of your I-526, and that's the form that you file, to get the temporary green card? What percentage of those temporary green card holders got their permanent green card? And if they don't say 100%, or if it's unknown quantity, and there's no track record, and they can't prove that it's 100%, then you don't want your clients to invest in that. So on that note, any final questions from the room? Yeah. Uh, so there is no EB five options anymore. I mean, it's not EB five, so. so it's more alternative if anyone. The EB five does still exist. Yeah. The problem is that it's not practical. It's more expensive, and you're looking at three to six years just to get your initial green card. I don't. I I see it as a plan Z. And it really is for people that have, they might have a, a visa that are already working here. They don't worry about the almost million dollars that they have to put into it and not seeing it for 10 years. And that's a very small group of people, which is why I recommend alternatives where they can control their own destiny, their own funds, and maybe even make money instead of putting it in the hands of unscrupulous developers or who knows what you know they could like like these horror stories that we just heard um it's better to always like they say empower yourself by choosing an avenue that allows you to control your own destiny so eb5 exists i i personally steer my clients away from it if there's any better option okay. there's lots of successful ones yeah i got one important clients from dubai that we got this uh, eb5 and uh, what there is no center five days ago well, not easy. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've gotten more than 100 tweets. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying right now, taking into consideration holistically all the different factors, it's not probably not the best option for most people. Somebody who has seven properties in Dubai is, does not need to worry about you know the $800,000 sitting for 10 years. Like most most mortals <laughs> don't don't have that luxury. I was very worried. <laughs> That's the purpose of my question about the foreign clients coming from Morocco to invest in this state or to get their uh, immigration. Uh, job. Yeah, I mean, you uh, have to analyze just like my the, my, the co panelists have said, it, especially when it comes to taxes and LLCs and things, it's case by case. You have to you have to tailor, just like you would do for finding the perfect property for your clients, you have to tailor the solutions to 100% based on the specifics of that case and that person. I think the problem is balancing the the reality with the hope of the people coming here buying property because they don't they don't see all of the potential pitfalls and problems and you can you can scare them if you're not careful but they need to know reality at the end.
I mean, this is something I talk about all the time. The American dream, it's something that all of us that came from other places believe in. But that the flip side of that is that a lot of people think that once you get here, just the, the, what do they say? That the, the roads are paved with gold, right? Like that's not reality. You have to bust your, you know what, and you have to do things the right way and you have to have a plan. No, in the, there's an inverse relationship in my in, in, in my 20 years of doing this between improvisation and success. The more you improvise, the less likely you are to be successful. And that goes with pre-immigration planning, taxes, and anything else. If you don't work with the right people and you don't plan and you know OCD level planning, then probably there's going to be error, and that margin of error grows as you improvise more. So it's all about planning, and and that that really, when you give your life over to someone, you have to make sure you're working with the right people. And that's why it's important for all of us to make sure that we vet people that we're bringing onto our team for each one of our clients. So we're just about on time. Let's take a final question from the gentleman in front. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Plan Z. Uh, I would suggest you uh, get rid of all of this. And how I became a citizen, I was uh, married in America. <laughs> <laughs> But even that's yeah. the requisites. Okay, so how many of you have seen the Gerard Depardieu movie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the old, like I said before, the, old, the immigration of law has not changed at all since 1986. It's been a complete circus. Um, but the one mainstay is if you legitimately marry someone, that is always the, the, the fastest and best solution. That, that has not changed. Legitimately. So, uh, I think it's time to say thank you very much to the panel, wow. and I hope you made a little bit